Okay, go for it. You mentioned that um, the criminal police are insane. It's in the construct of the three levels when the prisoners are third level. Who were they? Sorry? Who were the, the others? Who were they? Who, who actually constructed Okay, so the Ottoman state configuration is really interesting. In the Abbasid period, the ulama have always presented themselves as people who speak truth to power. Right? So the ulama's objective was, look, we're going to speak truth to power, but we're going to try to keep our distance from power. That doesn't happen in the Ottoman period. When the Ottoman Beylik is first established, the ulama, the military, and the leaders are part of the state building process together. And so what we say is that mulkiyah, which is the executive, askariya, which is the military, and ilmiya, which is the ulama, they were invested in the state building process collectively. When the ulama felt that the leader was problematic, they worked with the military to remove him. They no longer needed to speak truth to power because they were part of the power configuration. They could just use whatever tools necessary to remove him. So that's the basic framework. Then there's different types, layers of the ulama. There are local leaders. Um, then there are local military leaders. But the House of Osman, the decision was made was that the House of Osman would be the top of the, the pyramid. The reason they did that is because when the Ottomans were first coming to power, there were many other Muslim principalities that were fighting for control. So what everybody did is they decided, let's keep the House of Osman as the power. That's fine. And so now you have to be born in this household to be a leader. And then, you know, if you're not a good leader, we'll find ways of removing you. So that was the configuration. And this is why it becomes important because the, the idea of mesh, meshferet in Turkey or mashwara is that who's involved in this parliamentary system? Here they argue that the parliament had the capacity to remove the caliph from authority. And the parliament, they call it majlis amebu san, which means the majlis of the representatives. And they were representatives of the people, so they argued that they spoke on behalf of the people. So it's intriguing because I think it was Rashid Rada, he said that why should an educated alim have the same vote as somebody who's uneducated? So they tried to make a distinction that the democratic system gives everybody a vote, but maybe people are ignorant and they can be easily influenced. It should be the people who are educated who can make a more informed decision. And this was going through that process. In 1876, it was top down. In 1908, there were ground up um, elections, but you had to be above the age of 35, you had to have money and property to be able to vote. Is that right? I'll go there and I'll come to you, yeah? Yes? Uh, so, um, obviously the janitories were being disbanded, mm. there was what happened in Armenia, mm -hmm. obviously Russia was a massive factor. So, how do you put that all in the context? All right, so the, so the janitories. Yeah, how do you explain that? that yeah. So the, those of you that don't know who the Janissaries are, the Janissaries were a militia created by the Ottomans from the inception of the Ottoman dynasty. And they were called the Janissary Corps. So basically what happens is we, you have soldiers who are loyal to the Ottoman domains, but in nine, 19, 1826, uh, before Abdul Hamid, the Janissaries are disbanded. And it's because people feel, or the, the Sultan and his advisors feel, which is Mahmoud II and Salim III before him, that the Janissary armies were not sufficient enough to fight against the European powers. And we need a new military that can deal with that, drills and so forth, right? And um, it's very interesting in Turkey when you see, like if you see in Turkey the way we pray, we pray like we're soldiers. We move with the Imam up, down, left, right, and there's a reason for that. New soldiers were being taken from the peasantry from Anatolia into Istanbul, they were being taught drills, and they were being taught how to pray all at the same time. So it became systemized in that way. And so when they say SubhanAllah all this, and so forth, you, you see that. And so there was a tension now with the new soldiers and the Janissary Corps. Mahmoud II had an opportunity to wipe out the Janissaries, wipes them out. That leaves a power vacuum. So what we have is we have external problems, and we have internal problems with reform. If you want to change something, one of the things you're going to realize is not always, people are not always going to do as you say. Your intentions could be clean, but people might, look, you can work for an office, for example, and you can be a good manager, say, you know what, I need a new system in. They're not going to say, uh, you, you're not going to say to them, it's Islamic, let's do this. They're just going to say, look, what are you talking about? We were doing it like this before, I don't want your new system. Right? So here you see the, the, the contestation sometimes is, is just on a human level. And so the Janissaries are out, the encroachment of Russia, these are all problems for the Ottomans. And this is why Abdullah Hamid is having difficulty and he's just trying to hold the fort. And he was very skilled in using the different foreign powers against each other. Okay, but in the end, the, the younger generation, they wanted the expansion. 
They said, we can't be static, we need to go out. We lost the Balkans, we lost parts of Egypt, we need to go out and get this back. So this is where the tensions were, in that context. Okay, the Armenian question is a long one, unfortunately. It's, a, it's an issue of mainly to do with how you look at the Armenians. In the Hamidian period, I'm reluctant to say that the Armenians were massacred by Sultan Abdul Hamid. I think what happens is he gives a um, weapon to Kurdish tribes as a way that they can safeguard themselves. Things got out of control and a lot of Armenians were killed. And Abdul Hamid being in the center had, couldn't do much to control them. It, that is different than what happens in World War I in regards to the Armenian massacres. Um, some historians are trying to link them to, to suggest that this was happening from the beginning. But I'm not of that inclination. I think these are two separate events and they need two separate treatments. But the Armenian question is very loaded um, in, in that context. So, uh, you said, yeah. Russia, Britain first, side, yes, so um, the Ottomans actually, not only the British, they tried to look at the French as well yeah. and see how, how they could do it. But in the end, I mean, the hands, actually, they wanted to stay out of the war as much as they could. Yes and no. I mean, they had wars in Libya in 1911, and then they had wars in 1912 and 13, which were very short wars. So they thought World War I would be in and out. And in, unfortunately for them, they miscalculated because it became World War I, this long stretch. And then it's just about resources. How can you move people where and so forth? Um, so that was the problem. Yes? How exactly did the political systems run? What do you mean by how did the political system run? Okay, let me, I think I, I'm understanding what you're saying. So the question is, how did the political system run? Let's explain to you like this. And this is going to be like... All right. The Sultan is the Caliph. And he's delegated a role to the Grand Vizier. Okay? Alamma. Okay, so this is going to be a little bit crazy. He's going to see people are going, what's he going to draw board? You need to go. All right, so the Sharia is actually, so in the Ottoman period they said sovereignty belonged to the Sharia. So nobody's above the Sharia in this context, okay? Not even the, the Caliph. The Sharia laws were obviously implemented, and it was a job of the ulama to administer the implementation of the Sharia. So the ulama's then jurisdiction is legal. Here. So everything that's happening in the law courts, the ulama are deciding this. They're doing this and so forth. Right. The Sultan would use what they call kanuns from the Hanafi tradition of Urf. Okay, which is the idea that certain administrative laws, like how do we build a road? Can we build a school? What should it look like? Do we need to go to the, the Quran and Sunnah? No, not, not necessarily. Um, the Quran and Sunnah already influenced it. But the decisions had to be made independent from that. So what that means is that these were not in... That's the incorrect way of saying it. These were not independent laws from the Sharia. These were laws of administration which were implemented in matters where the Sharia didn't have a clear jurisdiction on it. Okay? In that context. So like I said, building of schools, building of buildings, roads, even some issues of punishment. Okay? So like um, they, they use that. So the Sultan... He used the kanun to complement the sharia, but the sharia was above the, the kanun. Under his jurisdiction was the grand vizier, and the grand vizier made the most decisions. So it's like your manager, and then he's the supervisor. And the supervisor has the majority of the authority. So wasn't the grand vizier the most trusted person? He was the most trusted person. And then what happened is sometimes these two offices would clash with each other, where the grand vizier felt that the sultan was incompetent. So the Grand Vizier got too much power in his hand and he started to do stuff. And then you see an internal contestation between the Grand Vizier and the Sultan, right? The office of the Sultan is the Sultanate. And the office of the Grand Vizier was called a 
sublime port, which is the Babi Ali. So you have these two now, right? Then you have the military and the ulama who worked under this, and that's created the administration. In the 19th century, what starts to happen is Abdul Hamid, he takes the authority away from the Grand Vizier and invest, invests it in the seat of the Sultanate itself. He became the main decision maker. But the challenge became is this, this admin became this big because it was a bureaucratic state. The bureaucracy was the machinery here, and that became a tricky now. And so you had people all these levels, how do you control them? It becomes very hard. And as we say in Turkey, the bureaucracy is feeding the bureaucracy. So, so that's mainly how it operated. The Sheikh al Islam was chosen by the Sultan and he was the main mufti uh, for the ulama. Yeah. Did he report to the Sultan or to the Grand Vizier? He reports to the Sultan. And the interesting thing is, is in the Ottoman period you have what you call a hal fatwa. It's an institutionalized fatwa where the Sheikh al-Islam writes to remove the Sultan from power. Yeah? You don't see this type of fatwa anywhere else. This is an Ottoman thing. That the, the Sheikh al-Islam, and the only way to remove a Sultan is to get a fatwa. And when they removed Abdul Hamid, it was really interesting how they constructed the questions. They said, if Zaid did to Ahmed, da 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 da, is it possible for him to remove? And it was like a, a question asking about something else, but it was. Re uh, it was referring to Abdul Hamid, and the Sheikh al Islam at the time didn't want to sign it. And you remember I showed you the picture of Hamdi Yazar who did the Quran? He's the one who asked the Sheikh al Islam, I have a question. And the Sheikh al Islam says, You're an alim, you don't need me to write this. And he goes, I'm asking you in my capacity as a regular Muslim, not as an alim. And then he writes, this, and it's interesting because they're afraid to give Abdul Hamid the, the fatwa. So the Muslims actually don't go to Abdul Hamid to give the fatwa. It's a couple of non Muslims who turn up and say, You're out. And Abdul Hamid goes, what are you talking about? He says, here's a fatwa, time for you to go. Speaking of the delegation, I yeah. there's a famous story about, I don't, I don't know, Karasa or whatever. Yeah. <coughs> I don't yeah, So basically, what's the relationship between Fatan Abdul Hamid and Zionism? And what was their role, so mm. to speak, in the removal of Abdul Hamid? The evidence on that is very weak. Um, this has become a common theme. It, it's not strong once again. So, even that we, we can't prove it. Really? Yeah, yeah. So those, those are wonderful memes, yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, but we can't actually prove it. And I understand why Muslims, like, they, they, they affiliate themselves to this. And there's a whole narrative that's been created around the narrative of Zionism, its influence, its power, and what it did to Islam to some degree. But actually, we don't have the physical data to actually see that. In, there's a lot of stories on Abdul Hamid that have been written by novelists, actually, that became very prominent. There was one story that, uh, uh, that was written about Abdul Hamid, and a lot of people thought that was his biography. Academics thought that was his biography. Abdul Hamid never wrote a biography. In fact, the best biography of Abdul Hamid is by a French academic by the name of Francois Georgeon. And that's disappointing in itself, because Muslims should be writing his biography. Yeah. Uh, Islam. Even that, we haven't been able to find that in the Ottoman archives. Sure. Yeah. So the question is about nationalism, especially from the Arab provinces. Generally, what we see is that nationalism was not a phenomenon within the Muslim areas, even from the Arabs. Um, nationalism was a phenomenon mainly in the Christian areas in the Balkans. Muslims didn't show any inclination to nationalism. So what we're doing is we're trying to show a distinction between Arabism, which is they wanted more cultural autonomy. They wanted to exercise more Arabic literature, Arabic culture, be more in control, decentralize the Ottoman domains, not have people come from Istanbul tell them what to do. And that's been translated into assuming that that was Arab nationalism or the seeds of Arab nationalism. Actually, when World War War I is happening, not all the Arabs are in support of the Arab nationalist project. In fact, many of them, we, 
they fight on the sides of the Ottomans, so Arabs are fighting each other in terms of this. And a lot of this information is not coming out because of the meta-narrative, which is that the Arabs betrayed the Ottomans, which is very unfair. And this is stuck in Turkey. And the two narratives that are stuck in Turkey is that the Arabs betrayed the Ottomans and the Turks were trying to Turkify the Arabs. And on both occasions, the evidence for that is very limited. But as I said, narratives stick. And narratives are quite powerful. And so people don't look at the information itself. Um, they just made horrendous mistakes in the war. Absolute horrendous mistakes in the war. Uh, and that's part of the problem. Yeah. Um, my question is about the education of the civil schools and the yeah. mentioned. From what I understood, when the Muslim caliphate, or mm. the Muslim rulers, if they were mm. caliphs, were in power, there was a lot of knowledge and progression mm -hmm. within the Muslim lands that the West would come to them. Yeah. At what point did that start to change that the, these latter Ottomans or some of the Turks mm. thought they would go to the West and then? How did that happen? As well? It's a difficult one to actually. The hardest thing is to say when did something begin, because we really don't know. But what we do realize in the 19th century is the world has become a smaller place. Right? Colonialism is expanded aggressively everywhere, and in that context, um, the Ottomans were not only actually learning in the West, by the way. The Ottomans had sent so, uh, students to China, to Japan, and those students were coming to the Ottoman domains too. And even they were looking at the Iranians, the Persians. What stuck is that the Ottomans were obsessed with the West, because this is a very, one of the narratives of modernity is it's very Western-centered. So it doesn't look at, so for example, the Japanese had defeated the Russians in the, in the war, and the Ottomans thought, whoa, if the Japanese could do that, we've got a chance, okay? Because the Japanese had the um, capacity to do that. So it's not clear, but the obsession of them going to the West didn't actually happen. They recognized the tools of the West and they tried to strip it down and make their own version. That was challenging for them. But how, how did that come about if initially more of the knowledge was actually within? Yeah, it was still within the Muslim lands, but now it's the, the more technical, Idea. So when you see scholarship like Mustafa Sabri Effendi, I mean, he's not diminished as a scholar compared to the scholars of the past. He's an exceptional scholar. So when it comes to Ulum al Din, actually, the Muslim scholars are still fantastic. The problem came in areas of technology, translation, scribes, and these sort of matters, which became important for the world at the time. So if you want to trade outside, if you, you need translators to trade and, and, and things like that. So that's where the challenge came because of this domination. So one of the arguments could be made is that it's not that the Ottomans failed the Muslim world. It's actually the Muslim world was failing the Ottomans, if you could make that. Do you understand? In the sense that because they were being colonized, the, the, the net was coming into the Ottomans. And the Ottomans are the only state that were not colonized. They had to be abolished. So that has to be remembered. The technology was still no, actually what's interesting, they say in World War I, the Germans say this themselves, that the speed in which the Ottomans had managed to get this technology was fascinating. And then obviously there's the Muslim zeal, the, man, the way they managed to fight for so long, that could not have been done with technology, that had to be done with... Why were so many people interested in outside of their own culture then? Some of them were non-Muslims, so a lot of non-Muslims bought things from outside in. So one of the concerns Abdul Hamid had is that the foreign schools and the missionary schools were doing a lot better than the Muslim schools, for example. And so we have this situation in many parts of the Muslim world. And so there's a concern now that, okay, these foreign skills are coming in, and these foreign skills are only being used by non-Muslims, and we can't exercise them in Muslims. But the other problem is, is look how big the domains is. Parts of it were modern, parts of it were demodern, parts of it were nomadic, parts of it were not. Right? A lot of rural areas, a lot of sand, a lot of village areas, a lot of... How do you make sense of all of that? And that's the difficulty. So keeping that large landmass intact requires a lot of negotiation and a lot of loyalty and a lot of hard work. So this is where the challenges were. One quickly, quick, like Al-Azhar, Abdul Hamid was concerned of Azhar, having an Azhar type university in Istanbul. Because he thought that if you institutionalize an Islamic university, it would only be concerned for itself. And it would just safeguard its own interests. And I don't want that. I want the ulama, and they had the ilmiya structure, to be more interested in the, the running of the day-to-day -day activity. So even that, they thought about. So people ask, why did they not build another Azhar? They could have done that. And a lot of the Arab scholars in the Arab provinces went to Azhar. They had no problem with that either. So the Muslim education wasn't the problem. It was the more technical skills where they were having the challenges in that context. Yeah. Yes and no. And I'll tell you why, that sounds like a cop-out answer. There are a lot of good books on Sultan Abdul Hamid, but it's really hard to sift through, for the untrained eye, 
to know what is acceptable and what isn't. That's why I wanted, I want to see more historians in general, so that we can actually help you. So like, for example, I give a syllabi to my students, and then we go through the books, and we say, why does this work, why does this not work? What's it? And then we give them, like, the archival sources themselves. They look at this, this is a document, this is what the book says, do you agree or disagree? That's the process of being a historian, but because of print capitalism, a lot of people just want the book and the book will tell us everything, and the book, in many ways, is the opinion of the author. So that's the challenge. But if you want, I can give to the organizers a list of things you can read and you can go through them. I have no problem doing that. None here? Okay, yes. We'll go you and then we'll go you. Yeah. Yes, please. Well, um, well, it's nice to meet you and um, it's been a lovely much We're all here for the same reason. Yeah. We want peace. Yeah. yeah. We want unity. Yeah. In essence, that's what we're here about. Yeah. I mean, the Almighty itself. Yeah. But from a basic point of view, obviously Islam mm. teaches everything. Mm. It's not the other way around. Yeah. So when we had our golden era, we should be proud of it. Mm -hmm. But if you understand, we've got people who probably hard to do fear. Mm. When you understand your Gita and so on, prophecy and so on, so all these things that have happened or happening, mm -hmm. it's kind of prophesized. Yeah. Because the world has to win. Okay. It has to be young, yeah. Etc. Et yeah. So when we, it kind of disappoints me when because we don't know our history. It's mm. very important to say to know your history, yeah. to improve your history. Yeah. So things like when Allah says in the Quran, well, Quran is the GP law. Yeah. If we read things are written, mm -hmm. even though we have a choice, yeah. but, and the other knows yeah. everything, yeah. we should be surprised what goes on. Because if you know you have yeah. to follow Allah and the Rasul and love yeah. Sahaba, etc., yeah. and do your best to follow them, mm -hmm. And I will show you the way and give right. you peace and prosperity. Right. But if you're not following those templates, mm -hmm. you're asking for trouble. Yeah. So all these empires, the Abbasid, mm -hmm. Mia, Fatimid, mm -hmm. Sassanid, all these mm -hmm. dynasties, they had utopia. Yeah. Things went bad. Mm -hmm. Allah wiped them out and replaced mm -hmm. them again. Mm -hmm. So it shouldn't surprise, surprise us. We shouldn't go into an nitty gritty I think. Mm -hmm. We just try to improve something. Okay. And I think. Revolution is a good thing, yeah. but we have problems on our sure. So, I understand the point. You're, yeah, I totally get what the point you're making. Says, yeah, yeah. Not weak, there's a vicissitude of For time. Sure. So, if Allah causes things, yeah. we should just accept it. Sure. The, the, the key is here is that humans have some level of agency, and humans have some capacity to make choice. And in that sense, humans have a right to um, show some level of displeasure towards the way that they're being treated. Now, human beings can act in a multiplicity of ways. We can tell people not to do these activities and stay put and so forth, but that's not, as you just mentioned, that's not the nature of human beings. Human beings are going to make all sorts of choices, and you have to then have the capacity to be, go back in time and say, okay, how did they deal with something similar? What choices did they make? In the Ottoman context, it's interesting. Abdul Hamid capitulated. He didn't use violence on them. He didn't use aggression on them. He said, fine. Head down, because he's Muslim. What's unique here is that the state was subservient to Islam. We say that the Ottoman state is an emotional state. That means it negotiated with its people. When the people were not upset, were upset, it said fine. It didn't go beyond that. And that's an important lesson I think many people can learn in that sense, in terms of that the state itself is the most powerful entity. The mass is an emotional board. It's going to make noise. The state is the abstract intelligent entity. And when it starts to use issues of aggression and violence, it's hard to explain to the mass. The state should understand that. The governance should understand that. It's that who you should, you should be speaking to. In the case of Abdullah Hamid, he understood that. Now looking today, it's a bit difficult. I'm completely sure. You don't really, um, I know because you don't know. Yeah. Now, um, you yeah. So the few details of how, but he does remember. Yes. That's a very problem. It is a very problem part. Yeah, yeah. So I was hoping maybe Maybe even the two wars, the Russo-Turkish war, mm -hmm. and the war against Greece, yeah. as opposed to India as well. Okay, so the, the Hijaz railway station is the project that Abdul Hamid um, believes in, which is the, the project for the pilgrims, which is to have a railway station that starts in Istanbul and goes all the way down to Makran Medina and actually stretch to Sana'a uh, in, in, in Yemen. And the idea is fundamentally for the pilgrims. That's the idea. So it's very different from what the, what the British are doing in India. Um, they're building infrastructure to be able to allow pilgrims to move up and down because 
trains, steamships, telegram, and newspaper. These were new forms of technology that were allowing access of information and, and movement to happen a lot faster. Abdul Hamid unfortunately didn't get to see um, the actual Hijaz railway station um, take off in that sense because the revolution happens and so forth. But it's a project he invested in heavily. The Germans did it because once again they had the tech and uh, the machinery uh, to do it and they built uh, the railway station and they had trains already in other parts of the Ottoman domains. So they had a railway that was going to Baghdad and they built a railway that goes into the Balkans. So this is not the only train service that they are they're providing, but it is fundamentally for the pilgrims. And in World War I, it's used to be able to move the soldiers from up to down. And so Lawrence recognizes this and he blows up the railway station to make sure it doesn't happen. It's a shame because now people are imagining the possibility of having a railway from Istanbul to the Arab world again. Um, Istanbul wants it, but the Arab world doesn't. So, uh, it, it's, but that would have been amazing. I mean, I remember living in Syria and seeing the Hijaz, a, a station of the Hijaz railway station, and they turned it into a coffee shop. And for me, that was heartbreaking because you could see the tracks on the ground still. And you're walking down the street, and these tracks were there, right? And just the, when when you see like the buildings they were building, it was. We have them still in Istanbul. Was, um, they beautified the train stations. People often ask me, why did they beautify these buildings, like the Masajid? Why are they beautiful? Because the Masajid were places that the masses could access. And the masses deserved to have something which was beautiful. And so the Sultan has his palace. But the mass could now go to the mosque and pray in the mosque, which was beautiful for them. And it felt like something belonged to them. So sometimes people say, shouldn't the mosque just look simple? Well, that's not the reason. You know, we beautify ourselves in Islam for that. In terms of the wars themselves, um, my memory is failing me now. I need to go over my notes a little bit in terms of the, the Russian wars and the Greek wars, just because I've sort of fudged it. So I'm going to um, apologize for that, actually. Um, but I'll come back to you and then give you the information on the two wars. But the wars were instrumental in the shift from going away from a constitutional system to a... Um, a lot of loss of territory, especially from the Circassian provinces. And we call them Cherkes. The Cherkes people were really fascinating because a lot of lives were lost in the, in, in the Russian provinces. They come into the Ottoman domains and quickly become part of the Ottoman administration. And Sultan Abdul Hamid's mother was Cherkes. People forget that. She died when he was 11. And then his stepmother, who couldn't have children, was also Cherkes. And she took care of him. He gave him most of his education. And it's an interesting story. When Abdul Hamid was young, he wasn't a religious kid. He was a naughty kid. He became religious as he got older. So um, that's just like any other kid that lives in society today, in that sense. And you, it gives you a sense of hope that if, the, if a young kid can become sultan one day, then who knows what you can become. Allah Ta'ala elevates in that context. And Yeah, and apart from imposing. But you know, it's interesting because I was explaining to you about he wasn't supposed to be the one in power. He was the third in line, right? And so, and Abdul Hamid was believed in a, astrology, um, which people get surprised by. He actually went to people and said, well, what's my future going to be like? And his mosque, Yildiz Jamid, star, some people say it's because it, he looked at, you know, he believed in that. Now, we, we really don't know. This, these are just legends we hear. But um, it was a science in the, Muslim, uh, in the Muslim world at the time still. So, yeah. Um, literature that there are some primers, but the problem with, we call them primers, which means they're, they're a collection of a total. The problem with primers is that most academics are specialists in a particular field. So their speciality is in that field, and you can see when they go outside of their field, their understanding of the history becomes a bit more shoddy. So I'm a bit, I can recommend some primers to you, like Carolyn Finkel's Osman's Dream, but her understanding of the 19th century and 18th century is not as tight as it should be because she's an early Ottoman historian, and you can see that. This is why I often recommend multiple books. So I'll give a list to the, to the um, organizers so you can read that, yeah? Yes, sir. Going back a bit, you know about Sinan going to Suleiman here? Yeah, so it's in the 16th century, so... Um, um, so I, I heard that when he built it, he also built the office of the chef on Islam. Yeah, it's still there. Then, um, it's still there. It's still there. Yeah, it's still there. Episode, yeah, episode's building is still there. If that's the office of Sheikh Islam, it's still there. Oh, is that the, the, on the corner of the Dalai Yes, 
Yeah, so you've been there, right? So that top corner was Ebersud's own building. Now, what they might have destroyed was the office of the Sheikh al-Islamid and closed that down. That's possible. But the office of the Sheikh al-Islam in the Sulaymaniyah compound is where Darul Hadith is in the corner, Ebersud's building. But you have to know the people at Darul Hadith so that they can take you up there. So I'll speak to them. They, some people are nice, they'll take you up. Yes. Yeah, and in this period, the Muslims are really concerned about women's clothing, actually. It's, it's really interesting. Like, you, I remember giving my students a, a Mehmet Akif, and there was a piece by Mehmet Akif who wrote the Turkish National Anthem. And he's talking about Islamic civilization, Medinia. And this random paragraph comes in about women's clothing, which just catches all of us off guard. And he was, they were complaining that it was really fascinating, that the women are showing their wrists. So they were annoyed that the women were showing their wrists, actually, in this context. They just felt that more and more women were starting to become a lot more flagrant in their um, clothing choices. And that's because when Abdul Hamid did the education, there was education for women too. In, so the visibility of women was increasing in Ottoman society, naturally as it does. And this is a, a, a quite a shift from invisible to visible, right? And so a lot more women are going to school and so forth. And so as a result of that, the visibility of women in schools and in the public and space in market meant that some people became concerned regarding the clothing of women. This was a continued debate that went up until the Turkish Republic. And then the Turkish Republic decided to get involved in that debate in another way by changing women's clothing emancipating them, and so forth. Um, but there's some really fascinating pictures of women that wear like hijab, jilbab, and then this hat that has like a veil that goes across their face. Um, so the fashion sense was really unique. But the fashion sense in Istanbul is different than the fashion sense in the, the villages. Village women would have to work. They'd have to go in the village and work and, and field. And their hijab and clothing was a lot more flexible than in the city. To some degree, you could argue that the strict adherence to the hijab and khimar and jilbab was actually people who had privilege because they could do it. Whereas people who are working in the villages, they didn't have that same level of privilege, which gives you an indication of women's clothing and privilege and how it operates. It's really fascinating. And then a lot of women, they, they created their own clothes, their own forms of hijabs. Like, it's really fascinating to see like Kurdish women having like metal chains that go along here in, in Egypt, and, and then in Baladisham, and then in uh, Hijaz. Different women wore different forms of clothing. So, um, but there were attempts to, to make adjustments to the law because women were becoming a lot more visible outside. I don't know if that's necessarily a Hamidian thing though. I think the Young Turks also attempted it. Um, and the Young Turks are quite interesting because on the one hand they're trying to emancipate women with this narrative, and the other hand they're trying to restrict women. And so you have this backwards and forwards going on. Um, women become um, really important regarding the, the clothing issue. And clothing in the Ottoman domains is a really interesting thing to look at. As I said to you before, clothing mattered. And to clothing was a part of identity and who you were. And now we're all wearing clothing that looks really Western in some days. But in those days, if you look at the pictures, it's really fascinating the different Muslim cultures and communities wearing different types of clothing. The one thing the Ottomans unified though was the fez though. You go to India, you go to Mauritius, you go to... So the Songot in Malaysia, they copied the Fez. And when I went to Malaysia and met the Queen of Johor, she was explaining to me that we still keep the Fez and didn't put a beak on it, so that when you kiss the king's hand, there's no beak. And when you pray Salah, the beak doesn't hit the ground. So that's why the Fez was there. But in World War I, the Fez became problematic, because the Western soldiers could see these red hats and just pop, 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 pop them off. So you can see clothing, how it works and operates in that sense as well. So there's a, there's a to and fro to everything. And the point I'm making is Muslims have to constantly think how it operates. Yeah, go. Do you think we lost our golden era, which yeah. for a long time to do that? Do you think we lost our golden era due to what then? I think it's unfair to see. Complacency. I, I'm reluctant to, to critique Muslims in that context. I'll give an example. When the Ab Mongol invasion happens, it's extreme forms of violence. Usually you see collapse happening with extreme forms of violence, and then Muslims being unable to deal with that form of violence, and then it's taken a few centuries for Muslims to get their act together. So the Mongols decimate the Abbasids, and it takes 200 years, 300 years for the Ottomans to get their act together. And that violence, it creates intellectual gaps. 
Because you, what you do is you, you use forms of violence, legal, intellectual, and physical violence, create holes, then you fill it with something else. The point I'm making, when battle was done before, it was mm. obviously shields, swords, mm. obviously yeah, yeah. planes, yeah. 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 so as the drugs for and things, etc., yeah, yeah. et military, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. do you think the Ottoman Empire, mm. like many other empires, it just didn't anticipate this was what's going to happen, and that's because they wanted to create their own bubble, yeah. hence not controlling the world, mm. and just like the poor people, the laymen, they just, as you said, they're just like. They, they could have, but one of the advantages the Western powers had, as I said, was colonialism. <laughs> colonialism gave them the capacity to, fight, to, to squeeze finances out of colonized peoples and then use those finances to make weapons. And in the Ottoman context, that's a lot harder to do because you'd have to squeeze Muslims to such an extent to be able to compete with that sort of violent takeover of the world. I'll give you an example, sugar. Sugar's really fascinating. I'm giving these weird things I know. So sugar was created in competition to coffee. So the Ottomans were controlling coffee, and the Western powers said, we can't get access to coffee. We tell you what we do, we use slaves to make sugar. There's no overheads, because you don't pay money for slaves. You get sugar, you make sugar cheaper than coffee, you sell it around the world, and before you know it, everyone is taking the white powder. And then what you get is, you know, coffee becomes diminished in that sense. How could have the Ottomans competed with that? Because the type of violence you need to use to be able to do that. And so what you see, it's not only an issue of could the Ottomans have anticipated it, it's a difference of culture. It's a difference of the unwillingness of the Ottomans to abuse their own people to that extent. Yeah, moral standards. Yeah, I mean, they did have used peasants and so forth, but to that extent, that's, that's unthinkable in the Ottoman domains. And the ulama had a voice. They would critique the power for abusing um, the authority. And this is important when we're talking about today, how much authority does the power have? And how much can the ulama squeeze power? And if power is squeezing the masses, who's the, the middle, the glue in between that represents the masses? And in the Ottoman domains, they have this structure and system that, that's there. And this is why the sultans are a little nervous. Actually, the sultans are not as strong as you think they are, because they're always nervous about this reprisal that's going to come from this institution and this institution working with this institution. And so to some degree, you have to have these institutions to remind this guy that Allah is the most important thing because human beings' power is powerful and it can be intoxicating. Um, so you just mentioned, you touched a bit now upon the, the morals taking yeah. priority. And when you started your talk somewhere there, you also mentioned uh, part of the education of that mm. university is called morals. Yeah. Um, so if that was on the Ottomans, mm. thing, and they also had other restrictions, mm. so they wouldn't be exploiting the same way yeah. the non Muslims are. Yeah. With all of that, what strategies did the Sultan use to reduce the national debt as much as he did? How did he do that? Yeah, this is, well, initially, in the Tanzimat period, they took out loans. And this is the problem area, they took out loans. What he did is actually he diminished the spending of the Ottoman central government. What's even more interesting is taxes usually were collected locally. So this is idea that Istanbul is taking all the money and making the areas poor. Actually, taxes was usually administered on a local level. And so what they did is they tried to squeeze the taxes as much as they can, reduce the spending as much as they can. And it was easy to sell the idea of austerity to Muslims. So actually, in a strange way, the Muslims took a burden. The Muslims were expected to fight. And most of the times, Muslims used to fight. We had the military where you paid them. But on many occasions, just fee sabilillah, off you go. And out they went. When they built masajid, you gave them a stipend, but most people were just like fee sabilillah. And they built masajid for free. So there was a lot of burden that was taken on the Muslims' shoulders of doing things for the sake of Islam in the hope that they can get the act together. It didn't always work out. Yes, there were times where some people were actually abusing money and there was a lot of corruption. This was one of the complaints that was had, that local leaders became corrupt and they were making a lot of money. But he actually, in some ways, got his finances together pretty well. Abdul Hamid was far more successful than the Tanzimat leaders. In, he, studied, he, he was obsessed with finance. He was a very good mathematician in that sense. And he was hands-on in regards to the finance. And so people got frustrated. Because austerity makes people frustrated. So I said one problem was expansion. Another problem was austerity. People, you know, that happens even now when governments ask you to say, well, okay, you're going to spend less and so forth. Uh, if the expenditure reduced, what 
if anything was compromised, what was no longer being spent on? So one of the uh, arguments was was buildings. One of the arguments was was like you know just frivolous spending on um, clothing and traveling and things like that. So um, you know it sounds strange, um, but so there was that much of that, that, that. not to that degree. And, and what you see is that it's not a reflection of the whole because in some places you don't even need to spend. If you go to a village, nobody really cares. They can handle it. They can just one pound and it, it's sufficient. But in the big cities where the infrastructure is necessary, you can see the impact of it there as well in that context. But the building of schools was, a lot of money had to go into the building of schools. So quantity, they started with quantity in the hope they can feel the quality. Now, where do you get these teachers from? All the teachers were ulama. Imagine you build these new schools. Well, where are the teachers going to come from? You can't just bring them from Europe. So you have to use the workforce you have. And so they used the workforce. So some people say the ulama lost out because there's new schools. Actually, they didn't. They infiltrated the new schools because those were the jobs available. And so people were alims and teachers at the same time. And the Ottomans were trying to go through this. Um, but it's a difficult process because, as I said, the, we look at the domains, it's so big that the policies are different in different places in different ways. The main argument has always been centralization or decentralization. Should the state be centralized or should it be decentralized? If it's centralized, to what extent should the state have authority in the domains? And if it's decentralized, how much local authority should people have in terms of autonomy? And the Ottomans constantly went through that, centralization, decentralization. Yes, sorry. I'm really sorry I'm not looking at that. You should just give me a shout, yeah. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to hear you mention that it's important that we study history hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's a good point. Actually, I was speaking to a friend of mine who's an Abbasid historian yesterday, and we were saying, how can we find ways of trying to help the community, especially children, in the massages and community centers where we can create a curricula for things for them to read, right? And because, firstly, we don't have many Muslim historians, and those of those Muslim historians or academics or thinkers that we have, they're very invisible, like I'm invisible, right? So uh, when, when you guys invited me over, I recognize the fact that as a person, I'm very invisible and I'm hard to access and I'm not in the country and that's kind of unfair and I recognize that. So I think we need to put a bit more pressure on Muslims who are in these various fields to do a lot more for the local communities in finding ways to work with the imams and the ulama to create curricula that is both conducive in regards to ulama din and matters to do with this. I think we have to work together here. Um, my personal opinion is somebody asked me on a radio station once, um, why should Bengalis in East London study Ottoman history? It's an incorrect question. We should study everything. Because, you know, like, um, when I go to school, English people study everything. Absolutely everything. F study the French Revolution, I don't care. Just, we need that information. And what's even more interesting is English people are told, the world is your oyster, seven seas, go see what you want. And Muslims don't leave the island. You leave the island, the world is a dangerous place. You know, and this sort of restriction is problematic for me, in the sense that we are finding mechanisms ourselves to restrict the learning in our communities because we don't value it as much maybe. Um, but we need to have this dialogue actually between those of us who are in positions who are teaching and those of us who are in the community to come together to try to create this curricula for you. Um, otherwise it's gonna to be tough. There is that weekend yeah. We can put something together. I agree with you. Yeah, I agree with you. I think we need to have this conversation as a community. Um, in terms of the education that's being given to our children, how much, so that's fine in terms of the schools, but what supplementary education can we give to our kids that can be conducive for them? What supplementary education can we give to parents who can give to their kids at home? Do you understand? What sort of DVDs can they watch? What sort of websites can they go onto? I think that's where the conversation needs to go now so that we can help the community in terms of remaining attached in that sense. So I think that that's a really important point and I think this is a conversation we should be having and I'm more than happy to, to, to contribute to that in terms of trying to create this curricula for, for parents and for children and for just young people in particular in the various spaces of, as I said, the university is a 19th century model struggling in 21st century. We have so many mediums now. Um, like you, you guys are filming this and I'm now gonna be on the internet, which I didn't want, but it's, it is. Um, so yeah, I think it's a valid question. And maybe you can speak to the organizers and the community leaders. And first we have to recognize there's an issue. 
I, I was grateful that when I was in my mosque in Tutin that there's a recognition that we should have um, more done for young kids. So there, there is this recognition. I like that. Um, when I was young growing up, th there wasn't that recognition. You came, you prayed, you left. So, so. yep. Are we all right? All right. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm really sorry that I blocked.